as I start. Well, good morning. No matter how you interpret it, the title for this panel, Finance and the Real Economy, could not be more timely. Nor could we have four panelists who are more knowledgeable. Therefore, in order to get the maximum out of the short time that is available to us, let me simply set the logistics. Each panelist will open with a 10-minute comment. At the end of 40 minutes, I'm going to ask them a few questions arising out of things that they have said. And then I'll open it up for an exchange between them if one hasn't already occurred, which I hope will happen. And then, as soon as possible thereafter, after they've had the chance for a bun fight, um, I'll turn the questions over to you. Finally, to show how important it is that we all be as concise as possible, I'm speaking to the panelists, and I'm also speaking to those of you who from the floor who will be asking questions, I'm going to deprive you of the brilliant uh, preparation and introduction that I had prepared, which I know is going to break all of your hearts, and I'm going to confine myself to two brief comments. All of us, first of all, have a role to play in the global economy. This is true of hockey players, it's true of the inventors of computer apps, of com professors, of economists. It is also true of the banking sector, whose role is to be a trusted, and I underlined the word trusted, a trusted enabler of stability and of growth in the economy. Periodically, however, it reverses its role in the financial sector becomes a source of instability. And when this stems from activities which many characterize as broken trust by the major players in the world, the major financial players in the world, the result, as we have seen, is global contagion with devastating consequences. This is what this panel has to deal with. Or to put the question in another context, the financial industry's direct contribution to GDP in the United States is about 6% or half that of manufacturing. It's about closer to 7 in Canada. Yet according to the former head of the FDIC, Sheila Baer, the financial services share of all US business profits, which in the 1960s was 15%, rose to 35% during the 1990s, and in a decade that followed grew possibly as high as 45%. Now if you agree that profits should primarily be the reward for creating value. The question becomes, did an industry which contributed about 6% to the GDP really deliver 45% of all the value created by American business in the early part of this new century? And if you don't agree, well, that's what makes this panel interesting. Over to you, Ed Clark. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. I'm not sure you've tilted this, this introduction in, in my direction here. So uh, just delighted to be here and particularly honored to be with the, uh, the panel here, really a, an incredibly distinguished panel. I get that I'm here as a practitioner, and by the end of the day, you might decide that I was the perpetrator. Um, but I thought what I would do uh, is you know, I go over, and I want to be clear in the sense at the start that in the fundamentals, I agree with many of the points uh, that the panelists, I think, will make. I thought I should just spend a couple of minutes, though, uh, on where the TD Bank has been on some of these issues, because inevitably, where you are in the broad policy issues depends from where you start with. Uh, and we've tried to build a TD, a franchise model built on a very simple idea of what do consumers want. Uh, and so work from the consumers and go in instead of from the bank and go out. Uh, and that basically means people want better service, longer hours, better locations, and that's what we deliver. And as it turned out, and I want to emphasize that, as it turned out in the world that we lived in over the last 12 years, that was a good space to be. And we've averaged compounded total shareholder return of 15% a year since 2002, the best uh, in the Western world. In that process, we shifted the model uh, very dramatically. TD Bank used to be 55% earnings from its security dealers and 45% from the retail side. It's now 90% retail. 
and we made some decisive risk decisions. We were a top 10 player in the structured credit derivative business, and we exited that business at its peak in 2005 and 2006 because we didn't like the risk uh, characteristics of it and took enormous hits in terms of our earnings to exit and a lot of criticisms from our investors for doing so. We were the only bank in Canada to refuse to sell structured asset back commercial paper to our clients and customers because we did not like the risk characteristics for them, even though we were not going to bear any cost of that. And when we went in the United States, we are now a top 10 bank in the United States. Uh, we refused to do some prime lending, and again, we're heavily criticized by our investors for doing that. In building the bank, uh, we, we built a security dealer, which would be called a Volcker dealer in today's language, but did it long before this was, uh, in a sense, in vogue, uh, and took out proprietary trading, took out tail risk, uh, and said we should be, in fact, adding value. One of the things that we did was we capitalized the bank about two to three times what regulatory capital was uh, required at the time and stress tested the security dealer to make sure that in fact it could not suffer loss uh, in the financial crisis and it did not. As I mentioned, uh, we did go in the United States. We actually have more branches in the United States than we do in Canada. Um, and when the financial crisis came, uh, I wrote an article that then Ultimately, it was co-signed by all the bank CEOs in Canada, saying in, in the Financial Times, bring on reform, give us, force us to carry more capital, force us to carry more liquidity, because you, we believe that in that sense, regulation can be the friend of the well-run bank because it actually takes out your road to players. Uh, I don't have any slides today, so I thought I would just quickly summarize uh, the five points that I would like to make and then give slightly a bit of detail on each of them. So I agree with the core issue that we have worrying trends in non-productive leverage in society and growing inequality. I think there are technology issues, globalization issues, world savings and balance issues that are complex set of interchange, things that are causing these things. Uh, I think they're troubling. What's not clear to me is how you move and solve those issues. I think it's not, there are not simple magic bullets for any of them. I agree that there's been non-productive innovation in the financial sector, but I would like to point out that I think there's been very productive innovation in the traditional old-fashioned banking sector. I think the banks made a terrible, terrible error. They should have felt terrible after the financial crisis occurred. They should have apologized for the casino greed cultures that they built. But I think it's also important to recognize that they don't own all the problems. Uh, and, the, and I'll get into this. You have to look at public policies and the leaders of those public policies of what they were advocating at the time. I also think it's wrong to extrapolate from the misdeeds of the security dealers to attack old-fashioned banking for excessive consumer debt which I should, we will talk about, I'm sure. Um, I do recognize that all the panels recognize this, but I think it's important. Uh, there is a macroeconomic context here. If you make a good cheap, people will use a lot of it. We have made debt very cheap in society. We should not be surprised that they use a lot of it. And finally, well, politicians and policy makers must take responsibility for the environments in which they create, in which business and operate, Clearly, everyone in society struggle with how do you create business and national cultures where business leaders, who in some sense by definition often have better access to what is actually going on in the economy, can play a more positive role in helping to avoid bad public policy. So let me just quickly go through uh, and talk a bit about each of these points. So as I said, I agree, we're, producing, we're putting on non-productive debt right now. And did the, grant, uh, the transformation of the dealers that start to occur in the 90s uh, create excess risk? I agree with that. And clearly was much of that innovation not, in fact, value added to society. But if you look at the basic banking business, it's unbelievable the kind of innovation that's gone on that has made the consumer better off. If I go back to my own company, Canada Trust, 1976, moved to eight to eight, six days straight in a world of 10 to three banking. Today we're open seven days a week, 
We have call centers open 24 by 7 in four different languages in Canada. The mobility revolution is changing banking dramatically. It's changing banking around the world. It's reducing uh, cost, transaction costs to the consumers. We now have intelligent ATMs. People can deposit their checks remotely through mobile devices. If you look at the investment market today, you know, we can invest for less than $9 a trade. We have ETS or low cost forms. The invest TD offers an e-mutual fund of almost zero margin. Really, the consumer, I think, has an unbelievable opportunity to have dramatically lower banking and dramatically better uh, improvement. Indeed, I hope that's the case, because we're, as a bank, are spending more than a billion dollars a year on initiatives. But if they're not adding value to the consumer and to the economy, then we probably shouldn't be spending that money. I think on social issues, I think Canada is different. You shouldn't extrapolate necessarily from the US model to say it's the same. I think the two models are quite different. Uh, we've had a low income banking package for a long time in Canada. We've never moved the price. We enhance that package on occasions. We have guidelines on credit cards, not legislation. Interchange revenue on credit cards is 30 basis points less than the United States. The five Canadian banks plus Canada Trust built or interchange our debit system with zero debit charges. Interestingly, the industry, the retail industry has now come and said we would actually like to have some debit charges there because you're not investing enough in that. And so there will be, in fact, one, two basis points of interchange uh, moved in uh, in order to fund that investment. And if you take a look, despite the fact that the Canadian system is more concentrated, if you want to buy a CD, buy it in Canada, not in the United States. Uh, the value that you get is much higher. And if you look at lending rates, uh, they're, they're about the same. And if you look at things like overdraft, again, the, the system in Canada is, produces better value for the consumer. I think the tougher area, which we'll, I'm sure we'll get into, is but are the banks to blame for excessive consumer debt or excessive real estate inflation? Again, I think you have to be careful to extract from the US experience and say that applies around the world. If you take a look at what happened in the United States, it is hard to argue that government policy and regulation wasn't actually at the centerpiece of what caused the housing boom. Barney Frank used to go around and tell all the banks, we want you to do more subprime lending. We have mortgage interest deductibility in the United States. We have these central quasi-government agencies that were huge players in developing and, and contributing to this market. But that doesn't mean that Canada doesn't have an issue, but it's a slightly different issue. And I've spoken publicly about it significantly. I do believe that the Canadian consumer is becoming too indebted. Now that's not, if you take a look at the figures, is actually not an unsecured lending, so it does go to the heart of the housing issue. And so uh, non-secured lending is in fact flat, has been flat for years in Canada. It's all to do with housing inflation and the mortgage debt the consumer takes on. This is not a crisis about getting that mortgage paid back because of the nature of lending in Canada, where we have very conservative standards in what we lend. And so every time you do these simulations, you see the banks don't end up have suffering significant losses in a housing collapse. The issue is, though, that when consumers and debt themselves, the society and the economy becomes more fragile <coughs> because the consumer themselves become more fragile. A big uh, other difference between the two models, Canada and the United States, is that our regulation is principle-based and the U.S. regulation is detailed-based. We can get into this, but I think uh, what's clear to me is that, in fact, detailed regulations increase risk. You create an environment where if it is legal, you do it. If it's not, you don't. Whereas in Canada, we try to force people in the business to actually think about what the right thing to do. And it has been fascinating in the US to see what the political system, which is the other difference, is that the regulatory system in the United States is politicized, and in Canada, it is not. And so you have a financial crisis that's built around housing and money center banks. And the first thing that, that the politicians focus is on neither. Those both look too hard to solve. 
And so you spend all your time on debit cards and interchange revenues and overdraft fees, a whole set of things, and you say, that's where we will focus our attention. And it's not obvious that, in fact, changing your interchange revenue uh, regime in order to make Walmart better off is a cure to the financial crisis, and that's what happened in the United States. Again, just to reemphasize, I do think the macroeconomic environment matters, and there I think we have to spend more time if we're going to run low interest rates, and I think in the world we are for some time, we have to think about what are the other instruments that we can use to lean against the inevitable asset inflation that such a policy creates. Finally, you get to the, I think is the nub of the issue here, is the interaction between business and, and public policy, and what role do business leaders have to play in that. And the reality is, what makes business do well? It is that the simplicity of its goal structure, the narrowness of its focus. Business leaders believe, whether true or not, that they simply live in a world and react to it. They find opportunities and they go after them. They do not shape the world. Now, that's obviously not entirely true. And they clearly spend a lot of time trying at the edge to, to shape that world to their advantage. But the reality is that business leaders are successful because of the simplicity of their goal structure. Now, that, of course, means that they're probably not very good at talking about public policy. And when you hear business leaders talk about public policies, they generally describe public policies that are not what you might call good public policies and good business policies for self-interested, widely defined and long-term defined. They describe public policy in the interest of what is in their short term immediate interest. That is the nature of the beast you're dealing with when you're dealing with business people. And so how do you actually create a moral code that business leaders, who do understand a lot of what's going on, how do you actually extract that knowledge and have them interject in debates to, to talk about wider issues and to advocate policies that may not be in their short-term interest, but in fact are in their society's interest? I've spoken out a lot about inequality, about rising indebtedness, and I have to say that for some of my shareholders, this is inappropriate behavior because it is not in the interest of the shareholders in the immediate term uh, to do these things. And so in many of the issues of the day, excessive CEO compensation, no restraint on business activities, I think reflect that in the world, there has been a change in the moral code of what business leaders do. And with globalization, most business leaders believe that if, in fact, they intervene in these things, they are not representing their shareholders. And that we're in a world of winner takes all, and those that don't play by the roughest rules won't be there to play at all. How do you, in that atmosphere, shift it so that business leaders play a more responsible role? Because clearly, I think they could have helped and lent against some of the excesses that have occurred, and they're still occurring today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ed. Axel. Well, the responsibility of bankers and of politicians for the crash and so on has been noted over and over again. I think I'd like to begin by noting that the economic profession is not altogether innocent. Uh, we economists have a lot to answer for. Uh, in particular, uh, we invented inflation targeting. Uh, we argued that keying on the CPI uh, and letting the money supply uh, being perfectly elastic supply or, or bank reserves uh, was, was the thing to do. And this is the policy that created the housing bubble and the policy that created uh, uh, the enormous bank profits that were just mentioned. Secondly, deregulation. Uh, the regulatory system that was created as a response to the Great Depression of the 30s uh, made the US financial system into uh, what I call, uh, in another occasion, a ship with numerous 
uh, watertight compartments that would not sink. Uh, deregulation did away with all of that and made it into just a big bucket that uh, uh, sunk as soon as the hull was punctured in one place, with consequences uh, that we uh, now know. Well, uh, of course, that was the old economics. And we are doing new economics here, so we need not feel uh, too responsible. Uh, I want to bring up some of the distributive consequences of policy uh, that I think have not received the attention that they should. Uh, I have hardly heard them mentioned in, in this conference. Uh, when we build up or we allow an unstable web of contracts to be built up in the economy, uh, eventually some trivial event will start that unstable web collapsing into itself with defaults triggering more defaults. Uh, if you do nothing, you end up in the Great De Depression. So it's of the utmost importance to try to halt that process before it's run its full course. Now to do that, in principle, you have to decide on what contracts should be carried out to the letters and which ones should not. That is, uh, you will have to decide who, will, who must pay, who will get away without paying, who will get paid and who will not get paid, and so on, which is, of course, politically absolutely impossible to do. So what do you do? You try to stop the process and to reverse it by flooding the economy with liquidity uh, provided nowadays at 0.2% uh, of, uh, 0 .2 The thing to notice about this way of dealing with the situation is that it means doubling down on the policy that brought us into trouble in the first place. It was the low interest policy with a perfectly elastic supply of reserves that created the bubble. And we are now trying to, to uh, cure the consequences by doing more of the same thing. Why? Why are we doing that? Well, mainly because we need to recapitalize the banks. It becomes the unique privilege of banks to borrow at the Fed at 0.2%. Uh, so that they can cross the street and go and buy treasuries at, let's say, 3% uh, to build uh, back their balance sheets. The main advantage of this policy is that the general taxpayers do not understand it. This policy doesn't just accord a privilege to the banks as institutions. It, of course, also accords a privilege to the bankers. And that privilege is to take home big bonuses based on the profits created by this particular, and if I may say so, peculiar monetary policy. Now, that redistributes income from savers that earn nothing now on their savings 
but who will be taxed uh, so that the government can pay interest on the debt that is created in the process and that is held by the banks. And this uh, raises a question that I want to end on. What happened to the vision of free enterprise, of the free enterprise economy, where everyone was paid his marginal product? Because this process that I've sketched has absolutely nothing to do with uh, productivity. The general taxpayers, people in general, may not understand uh, the machinations that are going on. But they sense that something is seriously askew, and the result of that is that we get movements like the Tea Party in the United States, and generally an instability of the political process. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Joe. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, even if it's to talk about a, a, a very depressing subject. Um, I'm going to talk about finance and the real economy. And I'm going to begin uh, by just reminding uh, everyone here about the essential functions, the workings of, a, uh, of the financial sector uh, in the workings of a mo modern economy. Uh, and that includes the allocation of capital, uh, providing credit, uh, managing risk, running the payment mechanisms. Globally, it, it entails recycling the surpluses from, the, say, the surplus countries to uh, where in the world the, uh, there's a need for uh, additional funds. Um, it's absolutely critical for the success of the economy that these functions be performed well and efficiently. And that goes to two points that have been emphasized in the meetings of INEC since the very beginning. The fact that the financial sector is not an end in itself, but a means to an end. You don't uh, directly enjoy uh, financial services. It's, the, it's not the food you eat. It's not the clothes. It's not the culture. It's, it's uh, a means to... Uh, the overall economy achieving other objectives. And in that sense, the financial sector is supposed to be the servant of the rest of the economy, but in fact, it seems to become the master. And in fact, in many countries before the crisis, everybody talked about uh, the wonders of the growth of the financial sector as if that was the mark of the success uh, of an economy. Well. In the aftermath of, of the crisis, we all really recognized the failures. Uh, they failed in absolutely every dimension. They misallocated credit uh, capital. They didn't provide adequate credit for new job creation, uh, new ventures. Uh, and interestingly, while parts of, say, the America's financial system have been praised, like venture capital, in the area of small and medium-sized enterprises, credit to small and medium-sized enterprises, five, six years after the crisis, is still about 20% below what it was. We really haven't gotten the financial system to work in the way that it's supposed to. Uh, it's also very clear that the financial system didn't manage risk. In fact, it created risk. And while it wasn't doing what it was supposed to, it was not doing the things that it was, it was doing very inefficiently. It absorbed a very large share of GDP and some of the most talented individuals in the country. You know, one of the, I would say, sad things as a teacher is to see so many of our most talented students going into finance rather than into more productive activities, ones that would give them more satisfaction and contribute more to our economy. And in spite of absorbing a larger fraction of uh, GDP, as was already pointed out, and of, in spite uh, of an enormous share of profits, of corp the share of corporate profits of 40, 50, 60% before the crisis, uh, there's very little to show for it. 
in terms of overall economic performance. In fact, uh, I would argue it's a negative sum game. Their returns have been largely at the expense of the rest. And it's one of the reasons that the standards of living of most Americans have stagnated for decades. So, in a sense, there have been these huge consequences from, for the failure of our economic system. Uh, the failure of the financial system is contributed uh, in a very important way to uh, one of our major problems, a growing inequality, to the low growth, the high instability, the high level of indebtedness of the, of the government. We can engage in a, a, a long debate, and we don't have time here uh, to talk about was it the banking system itself, was it the regulators, was it the economists, uh, was it the monetary authorities. But I think what we can unambiguously say that uh, the financial system, whatever the cause, didn't do what it was supposed to uh, with enormous consequences uh, for our whole society. Well, uh, that leads to the question, uh, before coming into the question of, of how do we explain it, I want to give uh, one example, which is our payments me mechanism. I choose it not because it was one of the centerpieces of the crisis, uh, clearly, some of the things I'm going to talk about in a few minutes are much more uh, at the center of the crisis. But it shows in a very simple way uh, the way the dysfunctional nature of our financial system. Uh, what I'm talking about is uh, a major source of the rents uh, that accrue to the financial system and a major source of distortion in our economy. And that's the payments mechanism. You know, in, in elementary economics courses, we talk about the role of the financial system in running the payments mechanism. Well, it should be possible with modern technology to have an efficient electronic payments mechanism. The cost of transferring money from one person's banking account to a merchant when he makes a purchase should be minuscule. And yet, the credit and debit card companies regularly charge one, two, three percent or more. So it's like a tax on every transaction but a tax that goes to enrich the banks and the credit card companies rather than for public purpose. Uh, some countries have figured out what to do about this. Uh, in the United States and Dodd-Frank, they did a little bit on the debit card. Uh, but then they made a critical mistake. They turned it over to the Fed to enforce the regulation. And uh, the regulations that the Fed introduced were so outrageous that the court threw them out. Well, we again, huge topic, but what I want to move on to now is uh, what is the underlying problem? The under pro under underlying problem is a very simple one. It's a disparity between social and private returns. Social and private returns of organizations and of the managers of the organizations. In terms of organizational incentives, the problem is not only too big to fail, which has been talked about uh, here, but also too interconnected to fail, to correlate it to fail. Uh, and the fact that much of the profits are achieved as a result of predatory lending, abusive credit card practices, market manipulation, exercise of market power, as in the case of the payment mechanisms. And the disparity between social and private returns of managers, uh, including incentive structures that encourage short-sighted behavior and excessive risk-taking. All of this, of course, you have to ask the question, we thought that one of the strengths of the market economy was designing good incentive structures. Why did they design such bad incentive structures? And the answer, of course, has to do with failures of corporate governance. So the, the result of this is that uh, we have a financial sector that has been doing what it sh uh, hasn't been doing what it should, and has been do engaged in doing what it shouldn't. One of the themes of this conference has been in, in innovations, and the same distortions that I talked about before arise in the nature of innovations. If you have a disparity between social and private returns, you will have disparities, inefficiencies in the design of innovations. So the innovations in the financial sector. We're more focused at exploitation, at circumventing the regulations. Uh, this reminds me of, of, of the comment that Paul Volcker once made, where he said that 
Uh, he couldn't think of a single innovation of America's financial system that had led to the increase in productivity, uh, increase of well-being, other than the ATM machine. And he was wrong because the ATM machine was a British innovation. <laughs> so yes, there are important innovations of longer hours and being more focused on consumers that uh, were talked about. But those aren't high-tech innovations. Those were just being responsive to, to the needs of customers, which you would expect every organization to be functioning. There aren't, those aren't the, the sophisticated products that uh, enticed some of our most talented individuals to come up with, like high-frequency trading. And I'll say a word about that in a minute. So uh, when I look at uh, what's going on, uh, I'm not surprised that uh, the system hasn't worked as well, partly because, as I say, there's been a, a uh, distortion between private and social returns. But there's also been basic confusion about some basic concepts. And of course, it may be that this confusion about basic concepts is um, a natural consequence. They didn't want to learn what was not in their interest to learn. So there are four examples I've given here. The first is, is probably the most important idea, which is underlying a lot of the behavior in the financial system is the belief that any action between two, consulting, uh, uh, two, two consenting adults is OK. It improves societal welfare. But that perspective, of course, ignores externalities, ignores all the kinds of issues that Michael Sandel talked about last night, uh, ignores the consequences that those actions may have for the fundamental trust in our economic system. So the kinds of, of products that, say, Goldman Sachs produced that were designed to fail undermine clearly trust in our system. But there's a more general result. Bruce Greenwell and I had a very general theorem showing that when there is imperfect and asymmetric information in imperfect risk markets, markets are not, in general, efficient. There are a host of externalities that arise. And work, in, including in, in, in a, uh, a task force at INET, has been exploring some of the implications for what are called macroeconomic externalities. And these really make a big difference. One of the reasons why it's important to have a regulated financial system. The second is that I find it striking that how many financial institutions don't seem to understand the most important theorem in finance and economics, the Mogdiani-Miller theorem. They sort of believe that the more leverage, by creating leverage, you create wealth out of, out of nothing, out of thin air. Whereas, of course, the main concept of the Mogdian Miller theorem is that if you create leverage, you're just shifting risk from one place to another. You're not creating wealth out of thin air. And of course, you're, what you're doing, really, and the too big to fail, too connected to interconnected to fail, uh, too correlated to fail, what you're doing is shifting risk, risk into the public sector. The third and fourth examples I want to give are issues that have gotten increasing attention, particularly since the publication of Michael Lewis's book on high frequency trading. Some of us have been concerned about these for years. Um, one of the justifications of high frequency trading is that it increases price discovery. But none of the people who've advocated that have ever shown that it actually makes a more informative price system. In fact, what I've shown using a, a, a corollary of the grossman stiglitz theorem is that, in fact, high-frequency trading reduces the informativeness of the price system. But the real issue is these are examples. This is an example of uh, the financial sector not really taking into account what really, really matters. It's not what happens in one nanosecond versus another, but whether the price system is really working to reflect the values of the fundamentals underlying. And the fourth one, which Lord Adair uh, Turner has talked about a great deal, a failure to understand the theory of the second best. The notion that completing the market, there's been a big 
uh, agenda of completing the markets. But we know from the theory of second best that unless you w go all the way to having a full set of arrow debris securities, you aren't sure that you are going to improve welfare. And there are ample examples of theorems in economics showing that, in fact, you can make the equilibrium Pareto inferior by adding more markets. And in fact, the agenda of completing markets has actually increased uh, the instability of our economic system. So the, 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 the general point I want to make is that uh, these are all ways in which our financial system may have had innovations, but not innovations which have actually increased the performance of the economy. I said before that part of the problem was that a disparity between social and private returns, and one of the objectives of regulations is to design, uh, uh, to, to impose constraints and incentives that help align incentives to encourage financial sector to do what it should, um, and constraints to ensure that it shouldn't do what it shouldn't. And it's clear that we've had a, a, a regulatory uh, failures. But a couple points I want to make. The first echoes what was said last night by Michael uh, Sandel, which is the problem of compliance. The notion of the fines for not doing what you're supposed to do or doing what you shouldn't do uh, are supposed to be a signal that you aren't doing something, uh, that you're, you're doing something that is being viewed as being socially sanctioned. But our banks have taken the view that fines are just a cost of doing business. And if you can get away with it, that means that your profits are all the greater. Uh, so you look at what banks like Wells Fargo and almost every major bank and they engaged in practices that have long been socially sanctioned uh, without either accepting or denying. Wells Fargo paid a huge fine for engaging in racial discrimination. This is 40 years after the United States passed a law against racial discrimination. Uh, and yet, you know, that they discovered that racial discrimination increased their profits because on average, they were financially less sophisticated and they could be better exploited. So shareholder value means you're obligated to your shareholders to do that. Uh, and they did it, not, an, not really an adequate apology for what uh, they did. Uh, a whole set of abuses have come to light. Almost every day you pick up the Financial Times and you, there's a new set of abuse. And the answer is, it's just a cost of doing business. Uh, even a $500 million fine is minuscule compared to the profits that they could have made. Even lying to the court, saying that they had inspected the records to see that the uh, mortgage, uh, the person who owed money actually owed the money, they lied massively to the courts. Not an ounce of a real apology, and uh, they uh, then paid a fine, but in fact, they then circumvented the fine in ways uh, to just continue the kinds of abuses that they had engaged in. Well, uh, we have to really think about how do we get better uh, compliance. When we think about getting a financial se sector that actually serves the real sector, I think we may have to also think about a larger role for government. For a long time, there's a presumption that government can't do many things. Uh, there are government failures, but as we saw in the financial crisis, there are market failures. No government, or almost no government, has lost uh, misallocated resources and lost money on the scale of the U.S. financial markets. There are many successes, and I can go through many successes in public sector enterprises. What is clear is that the private sector has strong incentives to do what George Akerlof has called fishing for fools, making profits by figuring out who is the easiest to exploit. It may be the case that public banks engaged in lending to basic consumer lending, mortgages, 
SMEs may do a better job. They certainly have a different uh, objectives. There are many examples of uh, successful development banks. In the U.S. financial crisis, the New York State Mortgage Authority performed perfectly well, unlike Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that had been privatized in 1968. And that was because the public authority kept its eye on the ball of what it should be, uh, uh, of what its social function was. In conclusion, let me say, I believe it is possible to create a financial system which better serves the real economy. It, that kind of a financial system would have innovation that enables uh, uh, the system to really serve the real needs of our society better. And in many ways, some of the innovations in technology today enable us more effective regulation. So the question is not whether we can create a financial system that better serves the needs of our society, but will the politics allow it? Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And there. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a striking fact that over the last 50 years, finance got much bigger across most advanced economies. The broad figures for the US set out, for instance, in Robin Greenwood and David Schwarstein's paper, is that in 1950, the US financial system accounted for about 2.5% of US GDP. By the mid-1970s, about 4.5%. And on the eve of the crisis, about 8% of GDP. And as Paul has said, on some other measures, uh, such as gross operating surplus or equity value, much higher percentages than that. And Andy Haldane's figures illustrate the same figures for the UK. In addition, the financial system has drawn to itself high talented people, but paid them an enormous amount of money, even more than you can explain by the amount of talent. So the, the analysis by Thomas Philippon and Ariel Reshef shows an extraordinary excess of what you would expect to get for the skill levels of the people in that industry. An excess which has varied over time. It was about 70% above other sectors of the economy in the 1920s. It then fell to about 0% in the 1950s and 60s, but by the eve of the crisis, it was back at 70%. So we have a large and growing sector of the economy paying its uh, participants, its, its producers, a large amount of money. And we have, as Joe said, to ask questions about that. We can't simply accept that this is OK in the same way that we would uh, if, say, the restaurant industry grew. If the restaurant industry grew from 2% to 8% of the economy, we would say, well, that's because people like buying restaurant meals. But nobody gets up in the morning and say, oh, what shall I do today? I think I'll go and consume some financial services. That'll, well, there may be some people in this room who do that, but most people, <laughs> mo most normal people don't do that. It, it, it's good if it is performing good functions vis-a-vis -vis the economy, not if it is not. So we have to ask searching questions about why finance got so big, what it is doing, and whether that is valuable. Now, again, Greenwood and Schwarzstein have done a very useful exercise in breaking down the growth of the US financial system into what constitutes it. And it's useful to divide what has occurred into two elements. One, a change in what the financial system does vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the economy, i.e. actual services to the rest of the economy, and what it does in itself. If we focus on what it does vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the economy, you find some things which have grown, but no more than you might expect, like insurance. Insurance services have grown because we've got more things to insure. But actually, the growth of finance vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the economy is dominated by two things. One is credit. The financial system makes money out of the net interest margin on credit and the fees related to credit origination because we borrow more money. In the US in 1950, private credit to GDP was 50%. It rises relentlessly to 170% by the ease of the crisis. Because we borrow more money, the financial system makes more money uh, out of us. The other thing, which is, of course, linked to us, indeed, it's almost just the flip side of this on the other side of the balance sheet, the industry makes much more money out of asset management in all its many characters, mutual fund fees, uh, private equity fees, uh, hedge fund fees, and brokerage 
commissions and various forms of trading. And of course, if there is more credit, there's also something more on the asset side which has to be managed. So there are more services to the real economy. But the other striking feature of the growth of the size of the financial system is that it's doing an enormous amount of things apparently with itself. If you look at a bank balance sheet from 1950, you can understand what's going on. You will find that there are loans to the corporate sector or deposits from, there are loans to the household sector, there'll be some liquid assets held in government bonds, but the bit which has relates to the real economy will be the majority of the balance sheet. You can understand it. If you look at a major trading bank day now, uh, the Goldman Sachs or the Lehman Brothers as was, or the JP Morgans or the Barclays, the vast majority of the balance sheet has to do with trading vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the financial system. It has to do with prime brokerage relationships. It has to do with enormous amounts of interbank placements. And one of the striking features of what's occurred is this amazing increase in intra-financial intensity, in trading volumes. Trading volumes have increased dramatically relative to the real economic activities to which they create. And we've created an entire infrastructure of contracts, such as derivatives uh, and structured credit, which didn't exist before. Now, the pre-crisis orthodoxy was that both these developments, the rising intensity vis-a-vis -vis the real economy and the rising intensity within the system, were good. The rising intensity vis-a-vis -vis the real economy was good because credit to GDP was a positive thing. There's a lot of finance theory that suggests that and argues that, for instance, India or Bolivia don't have enough credit to GDP. There was a broad proposition in favor of financial deepening. As for the increase in intra-financial intensity, that was justified essentially, and Joe has suggested already, as a sort of hand-me-down from the nirvana of bliss of the Arrow de Brewer general equilibrium analysis. If only we all just create as many contracts as possible, complete all markets, and trade uh, continually between all the different agents, we will arrive at the Pareto efficient, a, a maximum possibility of, of, of human welfare. And that belief was embedded in a set of language, and I think this is an important point for us generally in INET, a set of language which rhetorically constrains the debate. Language such as market completion. Well, you wouldn't want to be in f against market completion. Things must be better if they're more complete, not less complete. Liquidity. Liquidity is always better. Price discovery. How could you possibly be against discovering things? Or credit, which Mr. and Mrs. Ordinary Joe uh, want to build their business. The crisis showed that that wasn't true, that we cannot have confidence that this system was generating, as was asserted, both greater efficiency and uh, greater uh, stability. I think there are two major issues we have to ask about the financial system. One is simply about efficiency and value for money. And we can focus that question on all this amazing intra-financial system activity, this trading activity, this contracts, these more complicated, as Axel said, web of relationships within uh, the financial system. The axiomatic assumption of neoclassical economics and the pre-crisis orthodoxy is that it must be adding value because it is completing markets. But Joe Stiglitz's work, above all, uh, has helped us understand that that ain't necessarily true. That more trading under some circumstances can be excessive because trading in financial instruments is not trading between two people who have different consumer preferences or production possibilities. It's trading between different people with different points of view over the state of an uncertain future. And that is different. More trading can be harmful. And it's also not true that more market completion, and Joe has said it already, is necessarily good. You create a CDS which is capable of hedging a risk, but the very fact of creating a, a CDS which is capable of hedging a risk enables other people to bet in a way can, that can destabilize the economy. And so there is a possibility that we can generate within the financial system, and essentially, as was discussed last night between Kirstia and, and Michael Sandel, a casino activity. Of course, it raises the question, as 
But why does that casino activity, why does get it survive? If this is a zero-sum trading game between people, why don't the systematic losers leave the game? And why does it matter to the rest of us if these guys care to go off into a casino and bet against one another? Well, it matters because that casino is to a degree kept going by a set of rents which arise in the retail end of the system and in the relationship between the retail and the wholesale, the scale of the asset management fees and the impact affections of the ability of the ordinary consumer to buy in a high uh, in an efficient fashion so I think there is a reasonable argument that we're not getting value for money that we are getting a proliferation of activity which is performing the fundamental function of intermediation more expensively than it needs to do but it's not the biggest issue Suppose that 8% of GDP didn't need to be 8%. Suppose we could have done this function for 6% of GDP. Well, we're on average sort of 2% worse off. But we're 10% worse off in all rich developed economies compared with the trend because of the crisis of 2008. And what that tells us is that the much bigger issue is the instability issue. The value for money issue, the wasted activity, the activity which isn't required is an important issue, but it is not as important as the instability uh, issue. And I think it's clear that greater financial intensity made the system more unstable, but in a way which really poses very difficult issues at the interface between finance theory and macroeconomics. Because when I think we get to the drivers of instability, the most important drivers are not actually the intra-financial system intensity. I think they're important. I think intra-financial system intensity created what I call the credit cycle on steroids, a hard wiring of instability in the way that people like Marcus Brunemeyer and Hyun Shin uh, have described, a, a way whereby we use things like value at risk and mark-to-market and secured financing in a way which made the system unstable. But while that inner guts of the system, the web of contracts is important, the even more important driver of financial instability is simply rising leverage of a particular form and a particular form on which finance theory and macroeconomics has been entirely silent or mainly silent or to the extent that not silent, it has been wrong. If you pick up most undergraduate textbooks, and we were talking earlier this morning about the role of what we have to do in teaching undergraduates and graduate economics, and they ask, you see how they describe the role of the banking system, they make two mistakes. First of all, they describe a system which takes money from savers and lends it to borrowers, failing to realize that the banking system creates credit, money, and purchasing power ab initio, de novo, and with an important role, therefore, within the economy. But also, again and again, it says, well, what banks do is they take deposits from households, and they lend money to businesses making, as Joe referred to earlier, the capital allocation process between alternative capital investments. As a description of what modern advanced economy banking systems does, this is completely mythological. This is very well described in a forthcoming paper from Alan Taylor and Maurice Schullerich, uh, reflecting some uh, INET-sponsored research. Basically, in advanced economies, 80-85% of our bank credit is not to do with funding capital investment, it is funding two things. It is funding either consumption, that may be valuable, but we need to understand why that is, why uh, a funding a consumer credit would be valuable and to what extent, and the vast majority of it funds real estate, sometimes either residential or commercial. Sometimes that is funding new real estate investment, which is a form of investment in the economy, but most of it is funding the purchase of already existing real estate. And it is fundamentally funding in a credit form a competition between ourselves for the ownership of locationally specific urban land. And that, I think, is absolutely fundamental to the instability cycle because it is that competition for the ownership of existing real estate and of locationally specific land which is in relatively fixed supply that creates instability. Because if you put together the fact that the banking system that can create infinite quantities of credit and money and purchasing power, and that urban land which is locationally desirable is in fixed supply, whenever in economics you put together something which is infinite and something which is fixed, you get an inherently undeterminate price. 
We have at the core of our financial system something which is bound to create inequality, bound to create credit and asset price cycles and booms, bound then to create crises and debt overhang and the balance sheet recessions about which Richard Koo has talked so uh, importantly. That really poses a fundamental challenge because it means that we have a free market system which left to itself will create a problem not just of a deadweight cost of too much activity in intra-financial activity that we don't need, but will also create too much of the wrong sort of debt. But with the irony that each one of that debt seen as its own looks perfectly socially useful. How could you deny that somebody borrowing for a mortgage is socially useful, but the collective impact of it is something which is incredibly difficult for us to manage and a fundamental problem at the interface between finance and macroeconomics? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that, Adair. That was very good, in fact, all of you. Let me, I'm going to now ask each of the panelists a question. I would hope that they could answer the question as quickly and as concisely as possible. And then if hopefully we'll get into an exchange, either because one of them has said something outrageous in his opening statement or in the answer to my, to my question. So the first question I'll put, uh, and I'll put the questions in the order in which they spoke, I'll put it to, to Ed. Ed, uh, the banking system has gotten a bit of a rough ride up here in the last <laughs> in the last little while. I it. I yeah, it. I don't understand why. Uh, the um, uh, but the fact is, that, didn't help. I no, the, uh, William Dudley, who the who probably is as close to Wall Street as any public servant could be, said that there's evidence um, of a deep-seated a cultural and an ethical failure in many large financial institutions. The fact of the matter is that. Canada's banks did not suffer the way that the US, the UK, and the European banks did. We in Canada talk about the cultural difference in our banks. Can you elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, so let me make uh, two points, and then I, if I, if I can, Chair will allow me here, I'll also uh, do a little reply to the three speakers. Um, so I, I, you know, I think you have to start with a view, which I do, is that uh, cultures can outrun business models. And so if you look at it at the company level, business models create the culture necessary for their success. And so I think as you moved in the 90s, the, the securities industry moved from being franchise play that said, our basic job here is to make our customers and clients better off, to the casino play where your clients became counterparties, you develop the culture. I think there was also, I think there's a complex topic, but clearly we've moved uh, moral norms of what are acceptable compensation to, to different levels than we had ever had before. And so you combine those two, you create a culture that I think is at the heart of, and they matter, cultures matter. And the flip side, if you have the right business model, then culture is enormously important because what we say, you know, we would have 85,000 FTEs, but that means close to 100,000 people working for us. A culture defines what people do when no one's looking. And it's very important that our people do the right thing when no one's looking. And so I think they are enormously possible. Yes, there are cultural differences between Canada and the United States, but I think part of those are formed out on how far Canadian businesses or banks transform themselves the way other banks did. And that was less developed in Canada. And as I said, we were in one sense the most developed and we purposely chose to get out of it and that clearly defined our culture. I also think in general, you in a small country, you have a sense that you can not outrun your country. Uh, now you could say the people running the Icelandic banks didn't seem to have that. <laughs> they made, no, we could actually destroy our country. But I'd say in general, in smaller countries, you do have a sense of community and in very large countries, that's hardly uh, hard to produce. And there's clearly a difference. I mean, the interesting thing is 90% of the times Canadians moan that their banks are too conservative, and they were happy when they were too conservative in there. But there is a general feeling in Canada that we'd like a more entrepreneurial society, and we don't reward entrepreneurship enough. But it does have its advantage that we're more culturally. If I can just, you know, take the, the, the list of where we're going, where I agree and don't agree, is I do think 
we're creating non-productive leverage. So I think this basic notion that we're doing a lot of lending that's only you know, really creating asset inflation is a core issue. Uh, I, it's not obvious to me, though, in a macroeconomic environment where everyone is saying, I mean, Mr. Draghi isn't saying, well, I should actually raise interest rates to slow down this asset accumulation. It is interesting to see that different countries have different impact. So the inflationary impact in Germany of running these policies hasn't been as large as it was in Spain when you ran these policies. And Spain differed very different from Portugal. So I keep going back to, if we're going to run and make debt free, which is what we have done, we're going to have to come up with better policies to lean to it and to assume that the bank system, if I have a mortgage sales force out there and the team leader says, every time we have a, you are about to originate another mortgage, I want a team huddle where their household debt is too large in Canada. I mean, it isn't going to happen, you know? And so I do think governments have to step up and say, here's the kind of policies. If we want to shrink the banking system, shrink the banking system. I guess the other way is, is that people move to say, okay, the banks are inefficient. I don't see any factual data of that. I don't see that the real cost of banking has gone up, quality adjusted. I think if you took the banking system today and went back 30 years ago and say, what does the consumer get today for a basic banking account? There's been tremendous productivity increases. If you look at investing, what we used to pay for investing, as I say, you could basically buy yourself, if you were sensible, ETFs, but basically you say you can have a diversified portfolio for free and it'll cost you nine bucks and you get your custody forever for that. We've taken the cost down. I think you're going to find on the trend, you know, in the exchange system, we are going to find the Bitcoin kind of technology is going to take intermediate transaction costs to zero. And that's what's going on here. So I think in the basic banking system, we've had tremendous and positive innovations. Thank you, Ed. I, I would also hope that the other panelists would take advantage of when they, you, my question comes to use it as a, they want to go after any of the others um, uh, in, in any way, shape, or form, except you're not allowed to criticize the perfection that exists in Canada. The, um, <laughs> <laughs> Axel, um, Citigroup, twice. Uh, Goldman Sachs, once, albeit not to the same extent, B of A, the same thing were failed to convince the regulators uh, uh, that they had the margin that were necessary uh, to increase dividends or to engage in share buybacks. Uh, I think the question is, is this simply part of a, a tougher process and people getting used to a tougher process, or is it that these big banks don't get it? I don't think they got it. <laughs> um, the, the fragility of the system uh, it's mostly a matter of very high leverage and, of course, uh, uh, stretch maturity. Uh, and uh, the, the problem we have in, in trying to bring this, uh, the system back to uh, a more robust state is very largely, I think, a matter of, um, of creating a system where where leverage is, is controlled. Um, I, I took up two topics before, and if I may, I, I'll Please. come back to it. First one was we got into trouble by inflation targeting. And the second one, the trouble was so serious because of the consequences of deregulation. What are we going to do about those two things? Um, on inflation targeting, I'm, when I was a student, which is 60 years ago, <laughs> um, or 55 years ago, uh, we read Gurley and Shaw and Patinkin, and the discussion among those uh, uh, res resulted in the doctrine that for, uh, for monetary and financial stability, policy needed to control one money stock and one rate of interest. In practice, uh, in the era of, of monetarism, 
whole focus was on controlling the quantity of money, and you did control the rate of interest. Um, this thing was relinquished in the, in the 90s. We went from Milton Friedman saying controlling just the money stock to Woodford saying just focus on one interest rate. And, um, and that has failed us. So what, mon what we need to do in the area of, of monetary policy is we need to bring back some measure of quantity control instead of just having an infinitely elastic supply of reserves at whatever the rate is. Uh, the second one um, is deregulation. Um, I think it's not very hopeful, uh, particularly after delving into Dodd-Frank a bit, <laughs> that we'll find a, a reasonably uh, simple uh, regulatory structure. Uh, what I think the bubble has shown is that the incentives in the financial system have been badly skewed. Uh, the system has played a game of, have been allowed to play a game of I win, you lose. Uh, uh, and um, we have to do something about that incentive structure. What would that be? Well, the point is, in finance, you have not been liable for the bad consequences of what you have been doing. Uh, the banks are bailed out, and the bankers are, are bailed out as, as well. Before the Great Depression, uh, U.S. banks had unlimited liability. Um, so a bank failed, and, uh, and the bankers were liable for, uh, uh, for the consequences. Uh, we then instituted a, pro, uh, a, a policy of regulating the banks by reserve requirements, rationing reserves, imposing uh, uh, reserve requirements and so on, and, uh, and we relinquished this liability business in part because it turned out uh, in the end we couldn't enforce it. We couldn't make the bankers paid for what, what they had created. Uh, well, today I think the incentives in the financial industries are, are skewed. As I said, uh, I win, you lose. Uh, and the way to cope with that may not be to impose this enormous welter of regulations in, in, in Dodd-Frank, uh, but, but we should think again about uh, liability for consequences. Um, and that could be done, for example, uh, by um, the compensation schemes in the banks, uh, where uh, when the, the bonuses are given uh, for some duration, uh, those bonuses come with a double liability provision or a triple liability provision. Can I just add, add, yeah. one, add one thing? And it picks up a theme uh, that's already been uh, talked about. In general, bank regulation may require uh, uh, using more than either just the interest rate or the money supply. Uh, for instance, Restrictions on the amount of real estate lending that would that would direct some of the problems that We want to know where the money is being used that has societal consequences and the neoliberal view was just call out a price and there are no macroeconomic externalities associated with 
how that gets allocated. They know better than anybody else. So I think that's one important change in the regulatory framework. Of, and we used to, some countries used to do this uh, because you know, developing countries did it as a regular basis because they said, we don't want just to have people creating a real estate bubble, we want jobs. And they were told not to do that, but I think we should learn from some of those successful developing countries. The second point, before the, uh, 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 we, we were talking about uh, one of the differences between Canada and the United States is principle-based regulation. Uh, and the idea, and this is also in the U, to some extent in the UK, you try to figure out what the regulation is designed rather than write down lots of details. Uh, in our legalistic system in the United States, you write down details, and then they always are trying to get around it at the, and, 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 and arbitrage at the margin. And that kind of system is really hard to run. That, that's very good. And I, I hope what Adair might pick it up when I ask him a question. Just, but before I go to Adair, I'm just going to ask you just one, if you could be as quick and briefly as you could. At the end of your remarks, you talked about uh, the whole question of the huge profitability of the, ba of the banks making large fines and by large settlements not all that important. Fact of the matter, do you think that if instead of settling there were large, open, transparent, and long during court cases in which reputations were really the consequence of the, of the settlement, do you think that would help? I want to ask Joe and then I'm going to go to Adair for a different okay. question. Then yeah. I'm going to open it up to Adair. Well, as I commented in my talk, the current system has the banks viewing the fines, which are negotiated, and which they never say are guilty or innocent. Uh, you know, just uh, we paid the fine $500 million. You sort of think that there must have been at least some evidence that they were guilty if they're going to pay $500 million or, or a billion dollars. Um, the cost of those fines is borne by the shareholders, not by the managers who've made the decisions. It's even worse than that that uh, even if the managers had to pay, it's the previous managers who made the decisions and got the profits. And this is the point that Axel was making. You really have to have clawbacks to make the managers responsible. Part of the problem, though, is they make so much money in the period in which things were going well, and the probability of getting caught is so low that it's very hard, really, to make them accountable without prison sentences. Now, I don't think long, drawn-out battles will, will uh, help that much because it's an uneven, uneven battlefield. Uh, the political process has so uh, uh, restricted the availability of money to the Department of Justice, the SEC, whereas the banks have, you know, war chests of really, literally hundreds of millions of dollars in le legal. So it's an un unlevel playing field. And it seems as if companies like Goldman Sachs and, and you know, uh, accusations that come in every day in the Financial Times, it just goes off their back. They, they know that a story today, people will forget about it in five days' time. Yes, there's some reputational risk. And you know, there are some banks who say, oh, I'm going to play a different game and are trying to say, OK, we want to deal a good reputation. But the others are saying, look, at you know, this is this is part of life uh, in the big city, and we're playing a high-stakes game. And uh, so I think it really, the only way you're going to get it is having individual accountability. All right, thank you. Adair, what I'd like to do is you, you attended, thanks, Joe. You wanted to, uh, to come in on that last, and by all means, come in on that last. I'd like to ask you a question, and you figure out how you're, you're going to handle it. One of the things I found very interesting in your own writings and you mentioned it up here, was the fact that, that uh, you feel that we need credit growth faster than GDP growth if, we, in fact, we're going to have an optimally growing economy. And, uh, and then you say that that inevitably leads to crisis and it leads to post-crisis recession. I believe, having looked at one of your papers, you announced you were on your way to China. You may have been in China recently. China's got excessive credit growth. Do you, what, do you think that's going to lead to the same conclusion? Well, I think the question as to what is going to happen on China is probably the biggest issue in financial stability over the next uh, five years. I mean, if this China credit boom were to go on and not crystallize now, uh, 
by 2020, you would have a $20 trillion economy with 250% debt to GDP ratio, which is $50 trillion of debt. If there's been capital liberalization, and by that time it's linked into the rest of the world, uh, we are looking at a potential for a, a credit crisis on a massive scale. But to pick up your, your, your general point, Paul, I mean, you're quite right. I have posed this question of why is growth so credit intensive and why does it appear to need to be so credit intensive and to set out a sort of stylized fact for the last 20 30 years rich developed economies have grown with nominal gdp growth rates of about five percent but they've had nominal credit growth of about 10 or 15 percent which necessarily means that the leverage ratio uh, relentlessly rises and I think eventually produces a point of a, a Minsky moment, a crisis, and a post-crisis overhang. And that does pose a fundamental question for us, uh, which is, did we need that credit growth to achieve um, that nominal GDP growth, i.e. a rate of growth of inflation of about 2 2.5%, and real growth? If it is, if we, if we really needed that credit growth to have the nominal GDP growth, then, as Minsky once said, uh, we do not have an equilibrium in a monetary economy with capitalist financial institutions as against in a Arrow de Brewer, Valrhasian uh, seed and corn uh, barter economy. Um, I believe that there are things that we can do to have a less credit intensive model of growth, but they require things that go way beyond the remit of central banks and financial regulators. They have to do with uh, both the role of real estate within our economy, but also, crucially, the role of inequality, because I think one of the things that is driving the increase in the credit intensity of growth uh, is an inequality effect. If I can then link that to Ed's point, there was something Ed said which I completely and utterly agreed with, and, and, and totally agreed with, and I think he put it beautifully, which is, in this area of if we believe that we can have credit cycles which are out of control and we want to constrain them, we cannot possibly ask the guys who are selling mortgages to take responsibility for it. As you put it, you can't expect them to go into a huddle and say, oh, my God, you know, Mrs. X wants this mortgage, seems to be right for her individually, but wow, you know, there's this sort of, you know, a fallacy of composition going on here. I've got to think this through. You've got to have that at the level of uh, public policy, and we have got to constrain the credit uh, cycle in public policy. You cannot do that, and that picks up what Axel says, through the inflation target. The inflation target Unlike what Vixel sought, Vixel sought that provided we hit low inflation by having the nominal interest rate in line with the natural rate of interest, all would be well. I think what we've learned is inflation targeting is not sufficient. We need to pay attention to quantity aggregates, but we need to pay attention to them for a quite different reason from what we thought back in the 1970s and 80s. There was a time when we thought that we'd got to pay attention to quantity aggregates on the liability side of the bank balance sheet, which is money, because it was a powerful forward indicator of inflation. In fact, we pretty soon realized that money is not a good forward indicator of inflation, but instead the credit aggregate, I mean, it's just the other side of the balance sheet, is a good forward indicator of future crisis and post-crisis recession. But what this does mean is I think we do have to, alongside addressing some of the fundamental drivers of the credit intensity of growth, like inequality, we have to have an approach to central banking and macro prudential regulation, which is paying attention to the overall leverage and rate of growth of leverage and where it resides in the economy. And as Joe said, by constraining it by some policies which some of the developing world have been using like loan-to-value ratio on uh, li limits, which pretty much for the last 30 years, people from the IMF and the World Bank have been turning up and saying, no, you don't want these. These are terribly old-fashioned. Uh, they get in the way of the uh, free market allocation of capital. Now, one of the good things that happened in Canada is that it's actually one of the few advanced economies which also had loan-to-value uh, limits through uh, the conditions for the insurability of, of mortgages, and you do use those, those tools. So I think we do have to accept that there is something called the credit cycle, which we have to manage, and we have to focus not on just the objective inflation, nor on just the instrument of the interest rate, both in terms of objectives and tools. We need a far wider focus. It's in a macroeconomic context. Yeah. And so if you come to a view that there's excessive you know, 
debt creation going on in society, the natural as an economist, your first reaction is, well, change the price. <laughs> and you know, if you change the price, you'll slow down that. And yet, you have every time you go to governments, and even in terms of the macro prudential, I mean, we fought it, you know, we argued against the government that we didn't want the amortization schedule that the government wanted on mortgages. We wanted to shorten it. You wanted to shorten it, yeah. Because we, we wanted to slow down the housing market, and that was an entirely uncontroversial stance that we took. Uh, and the government's constant, every time we go and say, you should tighten the rules one more notch here, because I think as long as we're at this kind of interest rates, we're going to have to just keep tightening the mortgage rules, because that's the only thing that leans against it. Well, I think the difficulty is that we can't just rely on interest rates. And I think the core of you can't rely on interest rates is the heterogeneity of the elasticity of response to interest rates in different segments of the economy. That whereas Vixel argued that there was one natural rate of interest, Seen from the point of view of the borrower, there are multiple different rates of interest. What I mean by that is, if we've got a real estate boom going on, and either commercial real estate borrowers or residential borrowers have got it into their mind that real estate prices are going to go up by 10%, varying the rate of interest by a half percent ain't going to slow that down. You've got to use quantitative levers. Yeah, and can no. I just say one, okay. one little sure. thing? Which and is then I've got to say something because we're starting to get over it. I'm going to ignore that stupid clock okay. because uh, they didn't put it on soon enough. Yeah. Please wrap up. I can't speak English. Yes, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> just a little point that it's not only the elasticity point that uh, Adair pointed out, it's also that there are large macroeconomic externalities that uh, when there's a credit bubble, we all suffer and that those credit bubbles tend to be focused on fixed assets like housing, real estate. And because that is the case, we have to directly uh, address uh, policy levers that can actually get at that. And that won't be through a single instrument like the interest rate. But, but I think, can I just do uh, one just more macro lie. point? Yeah. Yeah. And is, that is, is when I'll never get a loan from the TD bank. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but managing this rotation of the source of growth is hard to do. And every time you go to governments, they say, yeah, I agree with you in principle, but not right now. Yeah. And that's what perpetuates these things, because they're worried about short-term growth exactly. themselves. <laughs> so, all right, I am supposed to wrap up. We didn't get to the floor. Um, it's not your fault. It is. They, they, this thing didn't go on and tell us how we were doing. Um, one thing about being a politician is you blame somebody else. But the. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to, at, at, by means of wrap-up, I, I want to ask you a question. The fact of the matter is that if a man from Mars was listening to this conversation, you're all saying what we should do, and he would feel very confident that, in fact, we are going to solve, solve the problems that occurred out of, the, out of subprime, the subprime crisis. We're going to solve all of these problems that led to the 2008 recession. On the other hand, if you look at what's happening, as opposed to what we're saying, too big to fail is... The fact is, too big to fail is now worse than it was before. There is no treaty uh, for, the, uh, for uh, the Financial Stability Board that gives us the ability to sanction. There's very little coordination between the countries. And for God's sake, we now have switched from subprime in houses to subprime in cars. So at, tell me something. Despite everything that's been said up here, are we making progress? Uh, if I were to start off, I, I think absolutely. So I think you exaggerate. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, for the institutions that are regulated, I mean, today we are holding twice the capital that we were holding before, and we were unaffected by the crisis. And so I think across the board, banks are holding more liquidity and more capital. I think we are creating a non-bank sector, and I think we didn't get into that, but as you tighten down the regulation of the banking sector, those smart people go out of the banking sector and into the non-banking sector. So you have that. But I don't, I think we've made progress. It's just this is, we're in a macroeconomic environment that creates an enormous dilemma. We're addicted to leverage in society, and yet we seem to need leverage to keep the economy going. All right. Oh. You want to tell them that I haven't exaggerated? You want to defend? Go ahead, Joe. Well, I, I think it's a, 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 a proverbial half full, half empty. I think we have made some progress. Uh, I think the 
everybody understands the politics, particularly in a country like the United States where money plays such an important role in politics and there is so much money in the ranks that the financial sector has and has a strong incentive to try to maintain those ranks. Uh, I think it's very clear that we haven't done as much as we should have. Uh, what perhaps disturbs me the most, though, goes back to uh, what Adair said. Uh, there are some fundamental reasons that we've had this credit growth. And uh, because we don't, haven't fixed the fundamental reasons, politicians are always under the pressure to keep the economy at full employment. And if the only way you can keep the economy at full employment is keep the interest rate low and uh, deregulate and you know, hope that the bubble breaks after you leave office, rather than before, and Bush you know, had the bad luck that it broke before he left office. Uh, the, the fact is that, that uh, policymakers and governments are going to have an incentive to, to create a credit bubble. So to me, the fundamental issue is to go back to the question, why is it that we need, uh, we've relied so much on this credit creation to keep our economy at full employment. It's, it's good that we've kept, tried to keep it at full employment, but it's bad that, that we haven't gotten, gotten to the underlying problems. And that's really where I hope, you know, next time we can focus uh, some of the discussion of what are the underlying problems that have led it, the, us to have to rely on this, this credit expansion. There, then I, Axel, we have and made then I'm going to go this amount of progress. I don't know whether you can see this glass is a quarter full, but three quarter empty. I agree entirely with Ed. We've made quite a lot of progress on the specific thing of making the financial system itself more resilient. So I think the probability of failure of major banks because of what we've done on Basel III on capital is much less than before. But we have not dealt with the fundamental underlying problem of why is growth so credit intensive. And until we deal with that, we may end up piling up problems in another fashion, perhaps, 10 or 15 years hence. Thanks, Axel. Uh, on the too big to fail problem, which I think is not being addressed anywhere, uh, what we should try to do is to find uh, a provision that introduces a diseconomy of scale in banking. Uh, and uh, liability provisions for bankers is one way of doing it. Uh, that is, if there, we had these clawback uh, uh, provisions for individual bankers, uh, you would create a system where uh, people in one department of a big bank would suddenly have an intense interest in what is being done in other departments of the bank. And in, and you have the potential for creating essentially internal conflicts in the banks about uh, uh, policies being pursued, which in turn could lead to them shedding some departments and so on. And, uh, that's the only uh, diseconomy of scale that I have uh, seen mentioned. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to the floor, Jim. Thank you. Uh, outstanding panel. I have a question for Ed. Um, and there's been a fair bit of comments by uh, uh, Axel and Joseph about liability and clawing back and individual behavior and incentives. And, uh, and I was a bit surprised that I didn't hear the word board of directors brought up in, the, in this panel. Um, and specifically on the principles base versus the rules based. And, and this is for Ed. You've sat in several dozen audit and risk committee uh, meetings in your career. Can you tell me about the, um, the liability elements of how the audit and risk committee functions in a principles-based, because I understand they have some aspects of personal liability and, and that's where it plays and that's where the rubber meets the road. And does that go to system design or do I not under, understand it right? Sure, if I can just pick up, I completely agree on the compensation. So one of the things that we have in our place is that I have to, when I retire, hold my equity in the bank for two years, so I can't take my money and run. Uh, I've deferred all my cash bonuses into 
that equity and that long-term equity that, uh, that stays there. So I think there are things where you can get a whole organization, I completely agree with you, where everybody basically is putting their money on the equity and they have to hold the equity for a long time so that they really do feel the pain. Unfortunately, we saw cases where that was true and they still screwed up, so it's not a perfect answer to, to everything. I think on the, you know, on the, the mortgage system, I think, again, the fact that Canadian banks hold the mortgages on their balance sheet is an enormous factor in changing what kind of rules we push for because we end up owning that ultimate liability. And so I think this you know, disintermediation that's going on in the United States where you securitize and get it off and you're really only trying to decide how many seconds you have to hold it and would there's blow up in those seconds, that is at, at the core. But that's a system the U.S. People try to find that, and it embedded in having 30-year mortgages rather than shorter-term mortgages. It, you know, it's flawed. Um, but I think you know, in Canada, there's still things that we could do, I think, to slow this down and put more equity against houses. There are things, I think, micro rules. But in the end, uh, I think the banks have encouraged people. The one, another example would be, can you walk away from your home? And so we have one province you can, everywhere else you can't, and so when you borrow that mortgage, you're personally liable. There's a number of states in the United States, and the ones that got in the most trouble was where the consumer could take the mortgage out and then walk away from it. And I think there is ways in which you can move the system that everybody in the end owns liability for this. I can't, I can't see with the light my, is that sunny? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to question the panel's premise, which seems to be that the two biggest problems are, Good. one, that the biggest costs of a malfunctioning financial sector, as Adair said, rise because of financial instability. That's one. And the second, that the continuous rent-seeking and the relative growth of the financial sector is the other big problem. I think you're missing perhaps what is the single biggest problem, which is that on a day-by-day -day basis, there is very large scale misallocation of resources happening because of a financial sector with distorted incentives, not all of which is going to show up as a crisis. A resource allocation difference of a net positive value real rate of return of 4% versus 3% adds up very perniciously, very significantly if it's done year after year after year. And it doesn't show up in a crisis because not everything goes to pot. And I think that is the most pernicious problem. It's the hardest to catch. And related to this is the point that it's not the direct allocation of financial sector that matters. It's the norms the financial sector makes. We know from surveys of chief financial officers of the amount of foregone positive net present value return investments that are foregone because of short-termism reaction of mm -hmm. stock yes. markets, as an example. And I think governments, again, are the other big investor, react very negatively to the incentive structure, the norms set by the financial sector. And it would be great to get some numbers and focus on whether this is responsible for the secular decline in macroeconomic growth rates or not. Go ahead. I, I think there's a lot of truth in what you just uh, said that, let, let me try to uh, maybe just rephrase it a little bit, that uh, one, of, one of the things I mentioned very briefly is the financial sector has not been providing money to small and medium-sized enterprises, which can be an important part of the growth of any economy. They've been focused more on, on the one hand, uh, speculation, and on the other, you know, writing CDSs and things like that. And, uh, and on, on, on the other hand, recycling money to consumers. And any viable economy has to get money into creating new jobs. And so the, the incentive structure in the banking system is such that that's a lower profitability and higher risk, and they haven't been doing it. Uh, so th that's an example, I think, of the kind of misallocation of resources year after year, which adds up to a less dynamic, uh, vibrant uh, economy. Interestingly, another aspect of this is um, that, uh, on average, and you know, the the data that Ed talked about of bringing uh, uh, wealth management fees down is is very positive. That's at the the positive end. 
The average, though, they've been very good, the financial sector, at what, say, what George Akeloff has referred to as fishing for fools. They've been very successful in finding lots of people who don't understand that you can get uh, wealth management services for nine basis points, and they've been able to find lots of people who can pay 1%, 100 basis points. And uh, that means that if you think about it, and there have been a, a, some interesting studies in the UK when they went from a public to private pension, part of the social insurance system, the amount that a retiree gets is reduced by about 40% from what it would have been had they done it in the public sector. Uh, now, you got to believe that that's a big wedge. We're not talking about 1%. We're talking about a 40% lower retirement income. That's big. So I think that, there, that, that this kind of constant nickeling and diming that I described, you know, th that was the really brilliant thing about, say, charging uh, uh, the interchange fees and the credit cards. Nobody noticed it. It was just a few pennies here and there. But adding up, you're talking about billions and billions year after year, it really distorts our economy. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, the time regulators set a very, very strict time limit on us. And I think that it is really, it, it, it really is very symbolic of the issues that we are talking about that we have broken every principle set by the time regulators. <laughs> so thank you all very, very much, and thank the panel. Well done.